<laughs> Hello everybody, welcome to Monster Chiller Thriller 13! I'm your ghoulish host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're killing that like button and subscribing to the channel. If you don't, then I'll come find you. <laughs> Alright, so this year I went with an all Zinfandel lineup. Why? Why not? I just felt like it. I wanted to give the grape that got me into wine some love. Plus, Zin is a great Halloween wine. As per usual, each wine has something about the label and or name that fits a Halloween theme. These are potentially wines that you could serve at a party, though one is kind of expensive for a larger party. I wouldn't go, I won't go into the official pairings, but these wines will work with most sweet candies, various desserts, plus the usual finger foods. <sighs> okay, let's get started with the lineup. First off is a wine called Bone Shaker. Scary sounding, right? It's kind of a cool label, though not particularly Halloween-y. Anyway, this comes from the Han family. I typically like their wines, at least the Han branded wines. They started in 1979 when Nikki and Gabby Han first purchased Smith and Hook Winery. The Hook. <laughs> in what would become the Santa Lucia Highlands. This wine is still being made. Over the years, they purchased more vineyards in and around the area and partnered with other wine growers. Nikki was instrumental in the establishment of the Santa Lucia Highlands AVA, with it becoming official in 1991. Bone Shaker is just one wine. Zinfandel, they partner with wine growers in Lodi to source the fruit for the wine. This particular wine comes from two vineyards owned by Jason and Kimberly Eels. Ooh, that's scary. Or maybe it's Els. I'm not sure. It's spelled E-E-L-L-S. These vineyards are in a sub-appellation of Lodi called Mokalumne River AVA. Since this is not a very well-known AVA, I'm sure this is why Lodi is used instead on the label. Especially since Lodi has a pretty good reputation for Zinfandel. It appears that other vintages may have sourced uh, from other wine growers in Lodi. The eels, as I'm going to call them, have supplied grapes to Han for over 20 years and the website has tech sheets since at least the 2016 vintage. So if you're getting a, so you're getting a consistent quality. It does appear one of the two vineyards used was changed for the 2020 vintage. The wine is certified sustainable using the Lodi Rules certification. All of Han's wines have some kind of sustainable certification. SIP certified is the main one for their other wines and stands for sustainable in practice. It's one of the best known sustainable certs in California. Essentially, the grapes are organic. You know, I love organic because that's what happens when you die. You go back into the earth, though I do believe they allow some non-organic types of pesticides. Plus the winemaking and how they operate as a business needs to meet some pretty high standards. I have high standards, you're dead. Anyway, wines that have a sustainability certi certification are, quote, doing it right in my opinion. You know what I do right? Slay. Let's see the stats for this wine. The 2020 Bone Shaker Zinfandel sells for about $15.95. It is the Lodi ABA, though grapes come from the Mokalumne River Sub ABA. It's 100% Zinfandel. This text sheet doesn't state, state that, but the others do. Average vine age is 60 to 100 years. That's pretty old, kind of ripe for my, my little uh, scythe. Anyway, aging is 13 months in 60% oak, new, used type, whether it's new or used is not specified. Released March 2022, the ABV is 15%. The RS, well, it's unknown. This tech sheet doesn't specify, but the other vintages range from 2.5 to 4.1 grams per liter. The pH is 3.7. The TA is 6.4 grams per liter. Production, unknown for this vintage, though the prior two vintages stated 21,000 and 18,000 cases were made respectively. <laughs> okay, the next wine, Ooh, Omen. As I did more and more research on this wine, the more I realized that I may have stumbled upon a wine that can be considered a natural wine, kind of. 
Okay, so it comes from a company called Atlas Vineyard Management, which they have a company called Atlas Wine Company. Pretty sure that's how it's organized and well, not the other way around. So the vineyard company essentially takes care of all the vineyard stuff for a winery if they want to. They also have their own vineyards. They mostly manage vineyards in Oregon and California, but it looks like they've come to the Texas market recently. The wine company has two wines, Oro Bello and this one, <laughs> Omen. The winemaker for these wines is Alexander Remy. He is also the general manager for the vineyard management company. He got into the wine business in 2005 while finishing up a master's of food science degree. He then traveled to well, various well-known winemaking countries and regions to pursue his wine interests. He met his wife during this time and settled in Seattle to work in retail. Afterwards, he moved to California to be a wine technical consultant for a French company. He worked with wineries all along the West Coast as well as France, Argentina, and Chile. After this, he joined Atlas. For Omen <laughs> and Orobello, Alex partners with various vineyards in Cali for his wines. He also works with wineries within 50 miles of the vineyards they, they use to produce the wines. This way, he's not transporting the grapes or must for long distances, a way to reduce their carbon footprint. As I mentioned, this is kind of a natural wine. I wouldn't call it 100% natural, but looking at all the wines they make, I see a pattern of doing the least possible in the winery when making their wines. Most of the wines don't mention the type of farming used. Two of them say sustainably farmed, though only one is listed as certified. Both the wines are sourced from Sonoma, and Sonoma is just about 100% certified sustainable, as far as the two that are certified or say sustainable. Other things about the wines also say no additives, usually no toxic additives. Oh, I'm right, I rather like toxic stuff. It brings you closer to me faster. But they are transparent in saying that yeast is an additive and that they use minimal SO2. Native yeast is not an additive, and at least one wine uses native yeast. They all talk about low sugar or no sugar and being vegan friendly. As I mentioned in the Grazi review, wine is a low sugar beverage by default as far as no sugar. I can't remember what the maximum is, but it's a similar concept to a non-alcoholic beverage. There's going to be a small amount of alcohol in those things, but not really enough to matter. For sugar, it's still there. And there's a couple ways to measure sugar, one of which will give you a lower value, not dramatically lower, but possibly enough to legally claim no sugar. I'm just not a fan of the no low sugar thing since that's what that's like saying water is wet for dry table wines. Anyway, in reality, we need a legal definition of what a dry wine is in this country so that those that are in the somewhat semi-sweet category have to be labeled as such. All right, with that said, I think that they are doing a good job overall. I'd like to see the actual numbers to back up their claims. I'd like to see the RS and total SO2 numbers. <laughs> they do seem to have the rest of the usual stats, at least on the back of the label of this wine. Okay, let's get into the stats of this wine. The 2018 Omen Origins <laughs> Zinfandel sells for about $17.95. The Sierra Foothills AVA, though all the grapes come from the Fair Play Sub AVA, I don't play fair. An example of using a better known area for marketing purposes. 93% Zinfandel from the Sierra Moon Vineyard and 7% Petite Syrah from the Element 79 Vineyard. They're, a, they're very close to each other actually. Crushed and destemmed, well that's pretty standard, especially for these grapes. Most grapes are destemmed. Cold soaking for three days. Fermentation at 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Fairly standard for this kind of wine. Maceration, 10 to 20 days. I'm guessing the Zinfandel is 20 days and the Petite Syrah is 10. Zinfandel is a thin skinned grape, so it should take a little longer to get color. Even so, 100% Zin made traditionally should be somewhat translucent. Petite Syrah is a classic grape to use to gain color and doesn't require long maceration to get it. So we'll see what kind of color we get. These are vegan friendly no added SO2, it's rack and return. This can be a substitute for using a fining agent. It's a nat way to naturally clarify a wine. Aging nine months in French oak, no other info on this. The ABV is 13.3%, the pH is 3.6, and the TA is 
grams per liter. <laughs> Lastly, we have the Fancy Zin Ghost Block. Oh, this one is one of those wires I should have known more about as it's got a lot of history, kind of like me. I'll try to keep it short. The parent wine company is Napa Wine Company. The family who currently owns it first came to Napa in 1902 when Joseph Pelisa emigrated from Italy and bought some acreage in the area to farm over the years. Each subsequent member of the family continued with farming and other interests. During this time, they became suppliers of grapes for many, many wineries. 91 years after Joseph came to Napa, the family was able to acquire the ninth bonded winery in Napa, the Napa Wine Company. This winery was founded in 1877 by two Frenchmen, Jean Adolphe Brun and Jean Chai. I think it's Chai, I'm not sure, C H A I X, maybe it's Chakes, Shikes, probably Shikes. It was called Brun and Shikes Nouveau Medoc Winery in Oakville. Eventually, another winery was built next door called the Madonna Winery and was purchased and the two were combined. This is when the winery's name changed to Napa Wine Company from well, what I can tell. Enter Hugh Blind, who had bought the old Ingle Nook Winery and literally did what I do, destroy its reputation by making plonk. In 1989, the property where Napa Wine Company is on was put up for sale and the descendants of the Palisa family bought it. By 1995, they were open for business as mainly a custom crush facility. They also would make their own wines. All of their vineyards have been certified organic since 1991. That might sound a little weird, but remember they had been supplying grapes for 90 years before buying the Napa Wine Company. Besides them still being a custom crush for many wines, they now have four brands of their own. Ghost Block, <laughs> Elizabeth Rose, Oakville Winery and BW9, which means Bonded Winery 9. The winery also has some impressive neighbors like Opus 1, Silver Oak, Paradigm, among others. This wine comes from the vineyards behind the winery and called the Palisa Vineyard, named after Joseph's son, Andrew, and his wife, Babe. It's planted to Zinfandel is one of the last ones planted to that grape in the Oakville AVA, along with vines in the Lincoln Creek Vineyard to the south, named after the creek that runs through the vineyard. <laughs> Let's get the stats for this wine. The 2019 Ghost Block Zinfandel, $39.99. The Oakville AVA from the Palisa Vineyard, 100% Zinfandel, aged for 12 months in 40% new American oak and 4% in new Hungarian oak. The ABV is 14.9%, the pH is 3.59, the TA is 6.22 grams per liter. Production is 2,566 bottle packs and was released August of 2021. Okay, with all that, let's check out all these Zinfandels. <laughs> okay, enough of that. I'm actually surprised I put I did that whole thing like that and not talk normally. But I decided to see how I did well, how long I go. All right, so I'm gonna pour all the wines so I can just go right through them. Uh, also, you might be wondering why the Ghost Block is called Ghost Block. There is a vineyard called Ghost Block. Um, it's also to the south, also in Oakville, ABA. I thought I was gonna run out of gas on that one. Um, and that uh, was named after an old cemetery that's there. So again, scary, scary. So I'm excited. <clears throat> I'm really excited to try all these wines because I really didn't know that the Han people did both. I literally just kind of picked these somewhat at random. And um, so I've had a lot of other Han wines and I think they, they do a really great job of making wine. Um, so I'm really excited about trying the bone shaker. And then um, the, <clears throat> the Omen, I've had the Pinot and I didn't realize how natural this stuff was supposed to be. Um, but I remember, I remember liking it. I think I did like it. I don't know. Cali Pinot is always like a hit and miss for me, but the Zinfandel, I figured, you know, let's do that. Omen is ominous, right? <clears throat> so I thought it'd be kind of cool to do that. And then the ghost block, for for real, like the name Ghost Block sounded cool, it has the word ghost in it. 
Um, everyone tells me that the Ghost Block, you know, wines are killer wines, and you know, how come you don't know who they are? I'm like, well, you know, a lot of times these wines, especially if they're kind of supposedly well, supposed not supposedly supposed to be well known, um, if I don't have experience with them, if I never sold them, if I've never been tasted on them, you know, I've never been to a seminar or anything about them. I won't necessarily know them because especially in the types of jobs I've had, not everybody discusses the wines like I do, um, especially the last few jobs I've had. I've usually been, if not the most knowledgeable, at least one of the most knowledgeable. And really everybody, as far as what we talk about at work, it's always, it's usually about the wines we sell. So. When I said I didn't know much about this wine, it was considered kind of surprising. Now I gave myself some pretty healthy pours on these wines, but I'm gonna drink them, so kind of as per usual. I don't have my spit bucket. Horatio makes an appearance again. Yes, every year I have to tell you this. It, Horatio is not the character who is the skull in Macbeth. It's, I forgot who this time. It's somebody else. <laughs> anyway, I put in the lower third. But the first time I put the skull in there, I called it Horatio. And then I realized that I was referencing the wrong part of the play. Anyway, let's get into it. All right, so uh, this is Infidel. Um, you know, it's a fairly opaque. Now, I, I kind of mentioned in the intro that Zinfandel is actually a thin skin grape. So if you're making 100% Zin, unless you have a long maceration or you're supplementing the color somehow, um, it should be, it shouldn't be opaque. It's not truly opaque, but it's not as translucent as I would expect it to be um, for, for Zinfandel. But the thing is, most people think Zinfandel is a, a deep, dark color because that's how a lot of Zinfandels have been made. And uh, so that's how they're making it, especially it's a $15 one. That's the expectation for Zinfandel. Um, let's check it out. Ooh, I like it. So really rich in color, vanilla, cocoa. A little bit of smoke to it. Like a barbecue thing going on. Yeah, it's almost like a, it almost has like a barbecue sauce aroma to it. Kind of spicy, peppery. Yeah, mesquite. Red and black fruit. I mean, we got the blackberry, we got the raspberry, black raspberry, plum. Very, you know, ripe in nature for sure. Very rich. A bit of earth. That mesquite kind of gives you that little bit of um, bramble and like being out in the country type of type of thing. Let's check it out. I like it. it tastes really good. God, I miss Zinfandel. You know, I don't drink Zinfandel enough. I mean, I drank it a lot when I first started in 2005 with all this stuff. But, and it finishes dry, okay? So, like I mentioned, it, it, there was an RS a range of like 2.5 to 4.1 from other vintages. They didn't put it on this one. I would say it's definitely under 4. I mean, I would say 4.1 would be the maximum. It's probably closer to like 3. It really finishes out dry. I mean, the, the, it's an attack, a ripe attack on the fruit. And then it stays ripe but it, your mouth kind of dries out and it's not just the, the tannin that's in there. Zinfandel isn't necessarily a high tannin grape, um, but the, it's drying out. And there's a bit of, again, that smokiness kind of comes through, a little bit of ash, because <laughs> we all turn to ash at the end, don't we? Anyway, um, yeah, a, bit of a little bit of ash at the end, and it's in a good way. Sometimes you, you think it'd be like, oh, but it's kind of like the fire got put out, um, but you still got the barbecue going, you still got the aromas going. A little gritty and it's really rich like the, the fruit is really is really ripe very flavorful i said it dries out um it's got a little bit of a candy-fied like confectionery hard shell like you like you oh like you bit into like a raspberry candy hard hard candy so you've got that type of uh, texture going on but it's only like a brief period of time um a little bit of tobacco leaf going on here. Um, you've got that vanilla, that clove, the spices. So, you know, for short, you know, there's oak influence on this. 
I um, mean, for 15 to, you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 bucks, um, I think it's a solid wine. I mean, if you're going to have a party and you need something that's juicy, easy to drink, crowd pleasing wine, this is definitely something you could go with. Uh, alcohol wise, um, I, I notice the alcohol. Um, now, granted, it's been quite a few hours since, I, since I've eaten, but um, I do notice the alcohol. I don't think it's super high. I think it's in that 14%. I'm going back to see what it is just to make sure. 15, it is 15%. It's well integrated. Like, it's not like I drank it and it was like, oh, or I smelled it and like, oh, because sometimes 15 percenters are, are there. I knew it was a higher alcohol because I could feel it. I could feel it, you know, when I, when I swallow it. But yeah, I think it's, I think it's really, really well made um, for the price point, for the category that it's in. I'm gonna enjoy this. Yeah, tastes really good. All right, please throw it in the glass. Let's get into the Omen Origins. <laughs> I love the name o Omen. All right, I can already tell it's got a little more translucency to it, okay? Um, Though the Petit Syrah, them adding the Petit Syrah to this definitely gave it a, a, a little bit darker color, but it wasn't a lot. 7% Petit Syrah isn't a lot, but it's probably just enough so that it doesn't look like Pinot Noir. But I've seen some Pinot Noirs from Cali that kind of have this translucency, but this is a little bit more what I would expect from a Zinfandel, okay? You really know standing on the glass. Let's check it out. Ooh. I wouldn't call it funky. Actually, no, it's kind of weird. Okay, I, this is, let, let's let's aerate this really a lot. Okay, this is gonna be really bad to say, especially considering how natural this wine is, but it kind of smells like a pool toy. Like, it kind of smells like, you know, like a, like a beach ball. Like you, you, know, like a, you blew up a beach ball with like this Luxardo raspberry cherry thing going on, okay? Now that, that beach ball, that plasticky type of thing is kind of going away. So I don't know if it was just, you know, something that's just kind of will blow off. But there's also this um, old wood component that's starting to come through, kind of take over. Some of the polished wood. But I seriously, it's like, I feel like I'm in Florida. Like when I, when I used to, you know, as a kid, we'd go to Florida every summer and you go into like the, I guess we all, we always bought like the float, you know, the plastic float that you that you do when you go in the ocean. We always bought one. So we always went to like one of those beach shops. I feel like I walked into a beach shop. But also like a Pier 1 because I get this kind of um, incense type of thing going on. It's like they're competing with each other. It's like one time I saw the, the, the pool or the, you know, the, the, the floats and other times I smell like Pier 1. Like I smell either Beach Shop or Pier 1, you know, or, or some have a combination. And, and the, 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 the Pier 1 is, or World Market, for those of you that don't know what a Pier 1 is, um, spice shop or, you know, place that has like lots of wood and wicker and spices and things like that, um, is trying to take over. But also that kind of uh, liqueur type of thing, that Luxardo, Kier, Kirsch Royale type of thing on the fruit. So you get that raspberry, a lot of raspberry, a little blackberry, that type of stuff, and like a syrupy type of aroma, along with, you know, that earthiness that you get like from the Pier One type of thing. It's kind of all over the place. So let's see how it tastes. Pier One was victorious. Um, I, had the, I had the, had the attack, I had that, that the, um, the beach shop, you know, you go and get your get your beach attire, beach stuff, but that went away really quickly. And and Pier One just was like, no, get out of here. GT GTFO, right? Yeah, GTFO. Yeah, it, it tastes really good too. Now now that that's gone, the pool toy, you know, the, the the pool stuff is gone. But it's different. There's a little bit of menthol to this too. Maybe that's what I was associating. Maybe the menthol is what I was associating with with that. There's also this kind of mint tea, like mint and tea um, type of thing. Like a peach, a peach tea with mint, uh, iced tea type of thing going on with um, <clears throat> some other like herbaceousness to it. More of a raspberry tea, not really the peach, the raspberry tea. So it's not, so on the nose it was that Luxardo syrupy stuff. 
but when you taste it, it's more of a drier, like, um, iced tea that they added um, raspberry to, and a little bit of herbaceousness, uh, and maybe a touch of mintiness to it. It's kind of cool. This is definitely a, a different wine than I have had as far as Zinfandel. Not that I drink a lot of Zinfandel. The first one is more what I associate Zinfandel with. This is a different style of Zinfandel, and I'm kind of digging it. This comes across as an old world wine because even though the fruit's there, the non-fruit components are kind of taking over, and that's what happens with old world wine. Now, it definitely could be because you know they're doing very minimal to the wine. They they they, um, uh, they harvest it, and let's see, the, the alcohol was pretty low. 13.3, not low, moderate. <clears throat> so that's closer to an old world type of um, uh, alcohol level. It's also, if I remember correctly, I didn't put this in the, in the notes here, but uh, the Sierra Foothills is on average one of the highest elevation AVAs in California at around 2,400 feet. So higher elevation tends to make yourself, uh, it's, also in, it's also inland near near the mountains, right? Sierra Foothills. So you tend to have a little bit cooler climate um, based upon the other numbers, 3.6 pH, TA 5.3, that's not that high, the, the total, acidity, total acidity, but the pH is right in a sweet spot. It's not it's not super low to be like acidic, but, um, but yeah, it feels like there's a little bit of acidity to this, a little bit of freshness to it. It's interesting, okay? Um, you know, there's some spices, it's French oak, talking about that. Um, there are some baking spices in here. Now, now I get, now I'm getting more like cocoa, like hot cocoa on the nose. Like the, the pool toy, the plastic is gone. It's like gone, gone. Now it's like a mixture of like, you're having like this hot chocolate in Pier 1. And they threw some cinnamon sticks in there and some cardamom and other spices. That's the nose and on the, on the, on the palate, still got that raspberry tea with a little bit of mint leaves and some other stuff. It's interesting, I like it. And it's under 20 bucks. That's what's really cool about it. Okay, let's, let's go with the ghost block. Okay, um, definitely a bit of translucency. It's about as translucent as the uh, Omen. So that's cool. It is 100% Zinfandel. Okay. There's some money in this. I mean, it should be. It's $40. But you can smell it. You can smell the oak. And it's not a bad thing. You can smell that there's new oak on this. You know, a significant proportion. American is cheaper than, than French, but it's not like it's super cheap. The Hungarian is probably adding a little bit of different spiciness to it. It's only 4%. But I get really a great combination of fruit and non-fruit characteristics. So I get more black fruit, like the blackberry, than really the raspberry. But I get this type of um, kind of mint, kind of um, clove type of thing going on. Yeah, there's also a bit of um, smokiness to it. Like, like you're burning incense, like the smoke from incense, okay? A little bit of lavender, yeah, sandalwood, forest floor. Like if I was blinding this, I would have no idea where to go with this at first, right? I'd be like, man, it's not, I kind of, well, this one for sure, I wouldn't know what, I wouldn't know what to do with this one. Um, I, I wouldn't know what to call it. So it's not a classic American style. Um, so it would never, it would never be in an exam. This would be an exam. This is like, it, it's more classic, though the color isn't correct, but it tastes correct. Yeah, a little bit of toffee. Let's get it. Let's get it on the palate. It's not really fair. I'm tasting a forty dollar bottle of wine versus two twenty less than twenty dollar bottles of wine. Though I do like these, I like them for different reasons. This one is more refined, has more polish to it. Um, it's more serious. Like I said, you wouldn't you wouldn't be buying this wine for like a big party because no one's going to care about the wine. If you're going to do this, maybe you have like a couple friends over, and you're going to do something Halloween themed on Halloween or near Halloween. Maybe you're gonna watch a movie at your house and you made some like, you know, kind of cool dishes to do um, with it and you wanted something like a nice bottle of wine. This is what you buy. 
you do the, you do the ghost block for this. This is for, you do these. Well, this I think you do for yourself because I don't think it's as much of a crowd pleaser. I think I think not everyone will like the uh, the omen as much as I do. The bone shaker for sure. This is something that you could you could buy for like a Halloween party. Like it's one of the wines you have on there, and because you, you're gonna have lots of like sweets and candies, you know, you know, cupcakes and cakes and sweets and savory stuff. That'll work with that. Um, maybe you're gonna cater. You're gonna you know cater your 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 thing. Maybe you have some barbecue stuff. This barbecue in Zinfil is freaking badass. Okay, you can do this. This one would be perfect with barbecue. I mean, seriously, the Omen is right up my alley for barbecue, like brisket, ribs, sausages. Yeah. Yeah, you got a little bit of menthol with this, got a little bit of mint. You've got that polished wood going on. It's like when you, when you taste it, it's like you are in the barrel room. And you've got that vanilla, that clove, that cinnamon, cardamom, you've got um, all the baking spices. But you've also got that smooth, really rich tasting um, fruit, black and red fruits. It's not truly sweet, but it's ripe, okay? It doesn't help that, you know, it doesn't hurt that the, the oak is adding a bit of sweetness to the wine with that vanilla, a little bit of caramel to this. Like if you're doing caramel apples type of thing or just caramels, I mean, obviously as far as like candies, this one doesn't taste that sweet. I probably wouldn't do very much candy with this. I would probably stick with like regular food. But these two, you could do candies. Like this one, you could do definitely like uh, caramel, um, like, you know, a, 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 a chocolate with caramel inside them. Um, that type of stuff. But it's like that really nice kind of gooey caramel. Not like, you know, Milky Way with like this, which Milky Way would be great with that. Um, but you can do something like that with this. Yeah. Um, like a major chocolate cake, like all chocolate, chocolate icing, icing, icing. You can, I mean, it's still gonna, so the wine will come across as a little bit bitter, slightly bitter with something that sugary sweet, because these don't have that much sugar in them, but they taste sweet. So you could, you could get away with it. Oh man, and it's got like a spice component. Wow. Like, I've had some good Zinfandels. Not a lot. I've had some pricey Zinfandels. This is definitely in the top grouping of Zinfandels. It should be. That is that is spectacular. <clears throat> I do believe it's the best of the three. Now, if I was going to rank these two, well, I mean, let's taste this one again. Oh, wow. So there's a marked difference between these two. I, don't, I hate to say about the Han one. But this has a little more artificiality to it. Again, crowd pleaser. Um, I would say literally this is my favorite. This is my second favorite. This is my least favorite now. Whereas before I retasted that, I probably would have put these as a tie and would have been a coin flip. And like, well, would would kind of depend on what I got going on, what my mood is. But... I would say I would probably drink this one over that over I'd, pro I'd probably drink the omen over the bone shaker more than 50% of the time in general because I tasted all three but if I just like pulled the bottle and wanted to have some Zinfandel I would be totally happy with this and it's totally a crowd pleaser you probably well you won't be able to hear because I'll have a noise reduction but the what time is it the 1247 train has come through uh, as usual, I'm recording after midnight. <laughs> but yeah, um, I think these are all three solid wines. Uh, definitely for the price point, under 20 bucks, these are cool. This is definitely more the crowd pleaser, larger party type of thing. This is more of a serious wine and um, that you really kind of have to be prepared for. It's not going to be your usual California fruit bomb of, of a Zinfandel. It's definitely going to come across as, as a more or uh, less fruit forward wine. And this is, you know, it's Napa Zinfandel, which there isn't a lot of Napa Zinfandel. I mean, there's a decent amount, but um, Zinfandel is not a, as widely planted as Cabernet Sauvignon and some other grapes. And this this is polished. I mean, you can tell they, they put new oak on it. You can tell they put a lot of work in it. 
Um, and it tastes, it tastes that way. It tastes like a $40 plus bottle of wine. All right. Um, you know, that's going to do it for the monster chiller thriller. What? 13. Hope that's not an unlucky number. It can't be. I'm the grim reaper. It can't be unlucky, but it's my lucky number. This will probably be my most watched episode ever, or at least Halloween. I don't know. Anyway, um, if you see these in the store, this one may be hard to find because ghost block is, well, you saw it. It's like 2560 on six packs. So times six is you know, 13,000, 14,000 bottles. So not a lot of bottles to spread out to the entire United States and anywhere else they go to and then restaurants. So it might be harder to find, but um, hence why it's also 40 bucks. But if you can find it and you want to splurge, do it. Not just for Halloween, just in general, if you like Zinvindel. Um, I'm not sure how easy this will be. This should be pretty, easy to find kind of you can also buy it direct i know that from from them um and i have a link in the below you know link in the thing below and this one should be much easier to find I, I'm, I'm sure they're doing you know, twenty thousand bottle or cases so that's well twenty thousand times 12 is what a hundred some some hundred some thousand bottles whatever so um yeah you, this one should be much easier to find all right uh yeah that's gonna do it for uh the show so uh, if you enjoy what I'm doing here, please make sure you click the like button and subscribe and then tell your friends until next time. Well, I don't know. Cheers on all three. Cheers. Yeah, I don't know. Let me drink this. Yeah, until next time. <laughs>